Fantastic. You're clearly into your island. So um, I'm very envious of uh, the, the Seychelles and, uh, and of Madagascar as well. But there you are. Anyway, I hopefully everybody can hear me OK. I'm going to talk about Uganda, uh, which is the, the marvellous uh, Uganda Mammals and Mountains Tour that Major Trek have been doing for a good number of years now. And the beauty of Uganda is that the temperatures out there are pretty much the same throughout the whole year. So you're talking about sort of mid 20s uh, centigrade. And the wildlife pretty much um, remains the same um, throughout the whole year. So uh, the advantage of going to Uganda, possibly say September, October, if you go again in January, February, much of the, of the wildlife is, is fairly similar. Um, <clears throat> the advantage of going in the winter, of course, is you have the opportunity perhaps of seeing some uh, Western or Eastern Palearctic migrants that might be wintering there bird-wise, but otherwise the, the mammals are very, very much there all the time. So here is a map of pretty much um, uh, what you see on the, the Nature Trek um, site associated with um, the location. So we fly in to um, Antabi, uh, which you can hopefully just see with my cursor here. And pretty much we then go about a, a circular tour around the bottom end of the country. Uh, we're looking at places like Entebbe as our, as our base to start off with, to get ourselves refreshed and sorted out. Uh, we're right on the shores of uh, Lake Victoria, which, of course, we share with, um, uh, with some of the other countries. And um, we're very close to a place called Mabamba Swamp, uh, which is a very interesting place. Uh, then we move along uh, this, this area here into Lake Maburo into National Park, which is a very pleasant area, one of my favourites. Um, and then into the amazing but windy impenetrable forest area, looking for, of course, one of the highlights of the tour, which is the, the mountain gorillas. Uh, we then move up into this area here, which is the Queen Elizabeth National Park, uh, an amazing Kazinga uh, channel. And then pretty much the tour finishes around uh, Kabali, um, which is the area uh, just to the north. And then we, we, we whiz around back to Entabe. So I'm just going to start us off. We fly in normally by way of uh, Kenyan Airlines, um, so sometimes by Nairobi. Uh, we stop at Entebbe. And pretty much we get straight into some really good birds. So there's a botanical gardens at Entebbe. And this tends to be where we go on for the first sort of half day or so to have a look round. And straight away you're into exotic stuff like this Ross's Turaco. Um, and but people who are familiar with some of the birds of Africa will, will be familiar with broadbill roller. Um, the roller family in Africa is always something quite amazing. And uh, one of the specialities for this particular part of Africa is the black and white cast hornbill. So the hornbills are a spectacular family, and this is just an example. So this is a little taster, and actually, even now it's a botanical garden, um, there's actually quite a host of primates here as well, um, all sorts of different bits and pieces. So it's a good starter for 10. But of course, when we're on the, uh, the shores of Lake Victoria, uh, it's a very, very wildlife-rich area, and as a consequence, you can get nice and close to lots of water birds. And of course, the cattle egret is a, is a bird that is now sort of almost taking over the world, it seems, and is very common in, in this part of Africa. Um, of course, a very typical African bird is the hammercop, and the hammercop is a, is a fabulous thing you can see over many different parts of Africa, but you get really good views, and you can probably anticipate some of the photographic opportunities are, are pretty special here as well. Paul mentioned <laughs> on about the marabou stalks. Um, beauty, beauty is in the beholder, really, and as far as I'm concerned, the old marabou stalk has a certain amount of poison beauty about it, although its habits might not be fantastic. But here you can get very close and personal with the somewhat grotesque beak and head of a, of a marabou stalk. And absolutely, why not? And whilst you're on the shores of Lake Victoria, personally, I've never seen so many pie kingfishers. Um, normally, when you go to sort of places like Africa, you can see two or three, maybe four pie kingfishers. Here, they're flying around in flocks, absolutely in their droves. They do allow a nice close approach, so you can get a nice view of a very special bird of a very special group of birds, in my opinion. Anyway, we have to move on. So we're going up to uh, Mabamba Swamp. And um, this is to see a rather special bird. And we've got some local guides to take us out and show us uh, this special bird, which, of course, is the shoebill stork, uh, which is a bit of a one-off bird. And really, the only place you really like to see it in the world, really, is by going to the, um, the, the marshes and swamps uh, associated with this area in, in Uganda. So just like everywhere else in Africa, you'll find that uh, the helpers and guides are really nice people, very easy going, very helpful. And what we do is go out on small boats such as this, and then we're going out onto the swamp looking for some, some water birds. 
And on our way out there, we'll hopefully anticipate uh, things like the long-toed lapwing, uh, which is a rather, rather attractive bird. And an example of a Western Palaeotic migrant would be perhaps a wood sandpiper walking around on the huge lilies. And the amazing African jacana with his absolutely huge feet um, splashing around. So you get nice and close to, to a lot of the water birds that are very close to some of the boats as you, as you pass by. But of course, the one that everybody wants to see is this amazing shoebill stork, which is this prehistoric looking creature um, uh, that, that lives in these um, in this area, which is associated really with um, the papyrus reed bed. So you don't really see them away from that sort of habitat. And this bird basically feeds on just one thing, um, which is the, the lungfish that lives in the, in the waters here. So it grabs that uh, lungfish with a huge, that huge bill of its own and grabs hold of it and just swallows it and does it very, very quickly indeed. It is a prehistoric um, creature in as much that um, um, in, it takes... It's, it's a threatened species in as much as it has a very poor breeding output. So it might lay two eggs and uh, it might hatch two young, but in reality, only one of those young will actually survive. But it was a privilege to see the shoebill stalk. And, uh, and if you like a bit of a bonus, really, when you bear in mind that the, the trip is all about the mammals and mountains. Uh, Saddlebill stalk is another, I think, just as impressive creature. Uh, look at the colors on, on, the, on the plumage there. That amazing beak. Uh, a bit of a close up there just to really appreciate that. So, yeah, you've seen three good stalks already. Uh, a bit like Paul was mentioning earlier on, I think it's hard to beat a Toyota Land Cruiser as your mode of transport. And we do a lot of journeying around. Uh, so, that circular tour around the southern end of Uganda may not look very far, but it's some quite long journeys. So, we need to ensure that we're comfortable and also we have a, a, a good platform for seeing some of the wildlife that's there. So quite typically, the, the Toyota Land Cruisers are the, the typical workhorses of, of Africa and in many parts of the world, and it's what we take advantage of. So we move on to the next uh, little national reserve called uh, Lake Maburo, uh, which is a particular favourite of mine. It's a sort of a bushy area with lots of scrub and acacia. Um, and then these remarkable um, longhorn cattle, which are obviously, um, um, obviously beasts, um, uh, looked after by the locals, but how on earth a cow or a bull can actually hold its head up with the size of those horns is beyond me, but there you are. But we're straight into the wildlife here, and it's a sort of a it's sort of grass and can be fairly arid, this area here. Um, there is big game, but the beauty of this place is that there are no big predators, so you can actually get out and walk about, which I think is quite, a, quite something in Africa, so there's no lions or leopards to be too concerned about. Um, lapid face vulture, this one's in flight. I think Paul was on the ground earlier on. And a view from, um, from in the vehicle of a, a Burchell zebra, uh, which we can get to quite nice and close as well, which is really good. And with other sort of typical wildlife of this, this area is a defasa water buck. So um, if you looked at a, a book of uh, African mammals about 30, 40 years ago, it just used to say giraffe and water buck and what have you. Of course, since then, people have done a lot more work, and now you've got a lot of these um, species being split into, into separate species in their own right. A warthog is definitely one of my favourites, and this particular individual was, it must have been habituated because I was kneeling down right next to it, and it really didn't care. And there's a, there's a, few, there's a few stories in that face, I think, so uh, anything to get close to a water buck is, uh, to, sorry, to a uh, to warthog is always, is always pretty impressive. Um, so lovely, lovely creature. Of course, the indomitable uh, uh, buffalo, uh, pretty much uh, quite common in this area with a yellow-billed ox pecker on its back. And obviously they like wallowing in sort of muddy areas. And although it's a fairly dry area, there are quite a few water holes at Maburo. And this is where obviously we look for a lot of the wildlife. Uh, another one of my favorite African mammals, I just think they look so, 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 so beautiful and well, well marked. And, Lovely feature, lovely big eyes, big black eyelashes is the impala uh, with that impressive um, horns and it's two males locked together in a bit of a, a bit of a scuffle there for us to, to enjoy close to, close to hand. Another one I think is an underrated animal is the topi and there are lots of variants of this animal in Africa called different things in different parts. But the one here is called the topi, with this sort of burnished brass um, sort of uh, coat, which makes it very special. So you can see we do get very close to these animals. They're really not bothered. Uh, the lack of predators probably makes them um, a little bit more approachable. And although we, most of it is, is by vehicle, you can actually walk out to quite a lot of these animals. 
Uh, whilst we're at, uh, at, this, at this site, there's an opportunity going out onto a small boat, onto the freshwater area there, and getting close, up close and personal with some of the wildlife, including obviously the spectacular African fish eagle, um, more typical birds, very common, but nevertheless, one still wonderful, the yellow bill kite. And I know that if you go to Africa, you almost expect to see malachite kingfishes, but there's something very special about a bird that has those colours on it. And it's such a diminutive little kingfisher, always a pleasure to get really nice and close. Uh, some birders who might go on the tour might want to particularly see a fin foot, an African fin foot. Sorry about all the foliage in front. It just decided it didn't like me very much and was hiding away. So unlike most of the wildlife, the African fin foots do tend to be quite secretive and furtive. And an opportunity whilst you're actually cruising along alongside um, acacias, waterborne acacias, to see Western Palaeotic migrants, which in this case is a, is a squaco heron. Um, the general sort of area um, and just general species, long crested eagle is a, is a very typical raptor. So you do see a lot of medium sized and large raptors in this part of Africa. And most of them are really nice and close. That was just sitting on a branch above one of our safari vehicles one day. And we do have an opportunity at this site to actually sit next to ward holes and just see what happens in front, which I always think is very exciting. And you might have a job to try and work out what's going on here. But basically, you've got a wattle plover. Um, that's mobbing a python that's sort of coming from, from towards from us towards it. And uh, I kept thinking that it was getting too close and too close and eventually this python was gonna have it, but the python completely ignored um, uh, the plover's attitude and just simply slid it off and went off into the water as if there was nothing going on at all. But the beauty of Africa, of course, uh, and Eastern Africa is no different, is that you have an opportunity to sit and watching things like this just going off in front of you. A very, very rude Rothschild giraffe. And again, uh, a few years ago, I think every giraffe was just called giraffe, whereas these days now we know there's actually uh, several species of giraffe that inhabit, inhabit the continents. Moving on from this general areas, we starting sort of move up into some upland areas and we're just get, getting quite exciting. Uh, for many people, we're looking at seeing sort of the high point of the tour, which of course is to go into the windy impenetrable forest. And uh, what this thing envisions is actually going into a very humid, hot area to try and see the mountain gorilla. And it has to be said that um, there is a degree of fitness and stamina required for this part of the tour because it is extremely humid and it is sometimes hard work working in the forest. Um, there are numerous uh, family groups of uh, mountain gorillas uh, living in the forest. Uh, there's a very strict code and briefing associated before you go in. The group size is limited. You have a tracker that works with you. You have a couple of uh, guides working with you as well. And you pretty much do as you're told. Um, in general, it can take between three to six hours to actually find um, a, a particular family group of gorillas. They are visited every day uh, to ensure that they remain habituated either by the trackers and or um, eco-tourists. And once you find your gorillas, you're only allowed to stay there for one hour. You also pay the privilege. I think at the moment, it's something like 700 US dollars, the privilege for going in. And um, because there's a population in Rwanda and a population in Uganda, then those prices keep changing as one country tries to outdo another. I have to say though, um, <laughs> in my day it was $500 and I wasn't too sure I wanted to pay that amount of money, but once you're in there, it really is something. And this is a sort of, uh, the sort of view you might get. So we've just come across um, a family. Uh, people are avidly sort of taking photographs, not sure whether or not we could get any closer. And we're told not to approach the gorillas, not to look them in the eye, uh, not to do anything that might upset them. But no one tells a gorilla this, that often actually might walk towards you. And the young ones in particular are quite curious and might come and have a look at you. The adults completely blank you. But I had the, the wonderful privilege of sitting right next to um, the silverback um, for about an hour. Um, and he walked up to me and sat down and he made various noises, which I won't go into, but um, they weren't particularly pleasant. He's got a big bum. He's got a big tom. He's got a huge head. And I actually saw him sort of sitting there in a fairly sort of laid back uh, mode. Uh, but I also saw him go into the aggressive, aggressive mode as well when another gorilla approach too close so absolutely amazing beast um, and for some people a must-see creature and of all of all the apes probably the one I wanted to see uh, most of all 
Anyway, we had to move on from there because uh, the tour demanded us to go uh, further around to the Queen Elizabeth National Park and also to particularly get to the Kazinga Channel, uh, which is the, the area that um, uh, connects two lakes. And here there's a big buildup of, of, uh, of birds and animals. And again, we're finding more Western Palliata birds with uh, white winged terns, or what used to be called white winged black terns. And you can get pretty close to these birds and um, get some really nice images of them. Um, pink bat pelican is another typical bird of this sort of area. We also get the Eurasian uh, white pelicans as well. But of course, the mammals, they love the water. And so we want to see the mammals, don't we? And it's very hard when you're a bird at going to Africa because um, <laughs> the, ma the mammals tend to dominate, in my opinion. And even as a, as, an, as, a, as a bird, you tend to push the birds to one side because the mammals just take over. I would like to think there's probably three generations of elephant there with a little this one underneath and provide some fantastic opportunities and who can not want to watch a, a herd of elephants. Here's the old buffalo again. And of course, in the background, you might be able to see some African skimmers and lots of terns. And you actually go on a boat trip around the Kazinga Channel and uh, you have an opportunity to get very close to, to the animals and the birds. Um, the, the actual part of the, um, the main part of the Queen Elizabeth National Park is a, is a fairly arid grassland uh, prairie area with some savannah and bushes. Um, it's not as rich as, um, as if you're used to going to places like Tanzania, Kenya, and Botswana. It's not as wildlife rich as those. So it does take, some of the animals do take a bit of finding. Uh, this is one of the endemics or near endemics of this associated part of the Rift Valley, which is Uganda cob. And you see there's some similarity with the impala, but the impala doesn't actually occur um, here. So this is where the, the cob takes over. But I think it probably, it probably fits into the the same niche. In this general area, there are lots of sort of general purpose birds we can see over large parts of Uganda and Africa, such as uh, the speckled pigeon. Um, got an opportunity, if you're into your, um, into your other beasts, um, the, the agamas are really sort of the most common lizards you come across. I'm afraid I don't know which species this was. And one of the local specialities to try and see um, when it comes to the weavers is the, is the golden back weaver, which is a rather, rather special creature. I wasn't able to actually definitely identify this um, butterfly to a uh, species, but I just like the photograph. And whilst you're actually in the, the National Park, um, we're riding around in the, in the 4x4 Land Cruisers. Uh, a lot of the birds are coming nice and close to us, including this yellow billed uh, kite again. And you start seeing some of the generalist things like African pie wagtail and plain bat pick, pipit as just typical passerines to try and see. Uh, there are lions here and uh, there are hyenas and there are leopards as well. They're probably not as easy to see as they would be in places like Botswana, Tanzania, um, that's been covered elsewhere. But this is the accommodation you would stay at when you're exploring the Queen Elizabeth National Park, all rather comfortable. And it overlooks the Kazinga Channel. So you can actually look down and see uh, the multitude of wildlife down below you, even if you don't want to get any closer. Pretty comfortable on the inside, but typical of Africa, often need to leave in the mosquito nets. Um, not luxurious, but very comfortable. Um, the food is excellent. Um, so you have a, a broad range of diets. And um, as I understand it, when I was there, uh, we had quite a few vegetarians, a couple of vegans on our trip, and they were catered for admir admirably. Um, we don't eat hippos, but at, um, that was that little picture there was just to remind me to talk about food because uh, really there's, there's not really an issue with with um, devouring most aspects of food out there, um, can, assuming you know what you want to eat. It's not all big stuff as well. So there's some small diminutive sort of little creatures as well. Uh, dwarf mongoose are rather quaint little creatures that uh, move around in small little groups, and often quite tame, um, just sometimes just as nice as looking as uh, the, the bigger animals as well. And a close view of a battler, um, you normally just see them sort of um, cruising around overhead, rocking from side to side. You don't really often get a good view of one actually in a tree. And I think this was a, a young bird that hasn't quite come into full plumage as yet. Um, Black-headed herons out here um, tend to be sort of savanna herons. So we think of herons as water birds, but out here, they spend a lot of time actually out in the grasslands looking for rodents. And uh, you see this one's got a, a warthog and youngster just, just behind it. Just gonna finish off the, uh, the talk with a uh, a last blast of a place called Kabali. In Kabali, I haven't got any pictures of chimpanzees, but Kabali is where we actually visit to go and try and see some chimpanzees, which I have to say were as, as impressive as the gorillas, particularly with their awesome strength and how they, uh, they vocalise actually in the forest. But 
in the same sort of area. So it's quite a demanding place to, to be, but nowhere near as difficult as, as, um, uh, as, the, as the gorilla site. And so there is an opportunity of seeing lots of the primates here and wonderful butterflies, such as this African purple emperor. Uh, whilst we're staying at all these comfortable lodges um, around Uganda, there's an opportunity of seeing a number of uh, birds around your lodges, including snowy-headed robin, or snowy-headed robin chat, as it used to be called, and also the bronze sunbird, which is a, a local speciality in, in this side of, of East Africa. Uh, common bauble, yes, common bird, but in your lodges, you're gonna see nice views and close views of, of birds such as this. Just finishing the talk now, but just to also give you an indication that it's all about, it's all about the wildlife. We do take time out to, to, to appreciate the culture. The Ugandans are a very friendly race of people. Clearly they've had some tough times in their, in their previous history. Um, but there's an opportunity to, to mix with the locals, um, to see some of the merchandise and stuff that's on offer, and to really sort of just drinking the culture of this wonderful country. Very friendly, very friendly people indeed. Um, so just concluding, nice little sunset um, over the forests in Uganda. And uh, it's always been a very popular tour. And I'm quite sure it'll be popular again um, to the future. So Thank you very much for listening. A bit of a whistle stop tour, but that's what we have to do on these things. Uh, any questions, I'll try and answer them. Thank you so much.